All right. All right, folks, this is this is going to be fun. So um, buckle your nature journal utility belt um, because we are going to go deep with some foreshortening bird wings. Now, for little birds, you just draw the blur. Big soaring birds, there are some subtleties of wing foreshortening, which we've been looking at in the previous um, uh, weeks. And it's and and understanding the way that these things move together is 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 fun. So we're gonna just kind of quickly review what we did before. <laughs> oh, that's backwards. <laughs> Sorry again. Um, so a a bird that is 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 soaring past you. Um, if its wings are on a flat plane, when you're looking at it from a distance, um, it's it's going to be um, foreshortening in a fairly predictable way. The more that the wing tilts towards you, the shorter the wing appears. So you see that kind of short wing look. Longer when it's going straight over your head like that. You look up, you see the full frontal view of the of the raptor and that is that's really cool but if you're looking at it kind of from an angle then we get these foreshortening in the wings something that we were looking at last week with that was that when you look at a wing that is um with a little bit of a curve to it when it gets foreshortened do you see how that amount of the curve seems really pronounced? I mean, that's, that is, that all of a sudden there's this big bump on the wing and you don't really see that here. What's going on is the subtle curve from here to here has gotten condensed into this short space. It's still moving out in this direction, the same amount, but here that amount is spread out over this much space in here it looks like it's got this really big bumpy on the hind wing. So our brain, when we see it do this, we think, okay, the sides are gonna be straight, but just be expecting this, the, any curve in it is going to be much more angular and pronounced um, when the wings are foreshortened. So that's kind of an, an interesting subtlety of the way that these things foreshort. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go from things that are, are, are flat winged. Oh yeah, we, we also, then we looked at a little bit last time on when the bird is flying with what we call a dihedral. Dihedral means that the wings are tipped up. So if the wings are totally flat, no dihedral. This has a slight dihedral. So things like a harrier or a turkey vulture, they've got a really noticeable dihedral um, when they're flying around. Um, so when that happens, the foreshortening, I'm going to tilt these up a little bit more so that it makes more of a right angle because that's going to make the phenomenon that I'm about to show you a little bit more extreme. All right. When you see it from the side here, the wings look roughly the same, right? But if the bird is rocked, notice that you're now seeing a lot of this wing and less of this wing back here. Or if it tilts towards you, you're now seeing this wing back here big and this one short. So a little bit of dihedral means that a rock in the bird each wing is now going to appear as a different size. Now, the bird model I'm holding, by the way, um, is a free download. Uh, I think Ivea, the mad botanist, has put um, the link in the chat. And um, so you can get your own one of these. <clears throat> and but I'm going to be using this on the screen. I want to recommend, though, that people do get and cut out one of your own. I find it works a little bit better to print it out on sort of thicker. If you can get cardstock paper into your printer, that's the best. 
right? Um, because then it's just a little bit more stiff, easier to hold. So, but, but look at that. I mean, isn't that interesting? Like here, look at that. The wing that's coming towards you, right? It's coming, it's now crazy foreshortened. And this one you're seeing all of, or, right? Or that back wing can be, you know, you know, made really, really small. It's, we have a tendency to want to draw something that is bilaterally symmetrical, bilaterally symmetrical. We tend to draw things the same on that far wing, your brain goes, now it's gonna be same on the other side. So that's why making the little model really, really helps. And for us to kind of pay attention to these little changes, that really helps. I'm going to jump over to the document camera right now. And I'm going to just do a few little raptor doodles. And we'll be looking at um, drawing this little one from a few different angles, All right? Let's go there now. Oh, not that. All right. So the angle that I hold the bird at is going to be slightly different than the angle that you're looking at it. Um, because you're being projected from here, my eye is looking down at it from a, a slightly different direction. But I'll show you kind of what I do um, as I'm kind of blocking something like this in. Um, first, I'm going to get my pencil to cooperate. Um, let's say my body is here. Zoom down on that. There's my bird body. Um, my, and so that's going to be, you know, there's going to be a bird head, there's going to be a bird body, and then I'm going to put in a little slope for undertail coverts. That's the booty area right there in the bird of my bootio. Um, now, for this wing that is closer to me, um, so oh, but let's check this out. When this wing bird is coming straight towards you, you see the V, right? The V gets narrower. So just watch this front edge, watch this front edge, watch the front edge. It's a narrower, sharper V. And here the two signs light up. So here I can hold it when I'm looking straight on, the two sides of the wings line up with each other. But the minute I rock it towards you, either way, either coming towards you or flying away from you, you now see a V. So um, this bird, I'm going to give it a V. I'm going to look at what is the angle of my V. And the one that is coming towards me, I'm going to make short. And then here's this one that is going away from me. That is a long wing. Now, you may have a phenomenon going on right now where your brain is flipping this back and forth where sometimes this feels closer to you. Sometimes this side feels closer to you. There's no real visual cue um, that, is, that, that should be making one pop out towards you uh, at, at, at this point. Um, so on this far wing, so the first half of it is going to be primaries. The back half is secondaries. On this close wing here, the primaries are all tucked into this little zone on top and the secondaries down here. Now, I am going to draw in some wing edges. Drop down on this just a little bit more. 
<clears throat> so if you remember on, on primary feathers, there's this fanning zone out here where the feathers, they, they're going to fan out like this from this point right here. And only the first few really point stick out as fingery feathers like that. The back primaries, the, 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 the lower primaries in here, they are, they're not fingered. So only the first few are out there are fingered. That means, so what I'm gonna do on this wing is, actually, let, let me do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in case you were not here in previous classes, um, whoop. here is this wing real quick and dirty, the raptor wing. These are the secondary feathers. These are the primary feathers. The wrist is right here. The primaries are a fan. The secondaries are all coming straight back. Only the first ones out here towards the tip are, are fingered. So if I were to draw those in, I come along this edge, I'm gonna start smaller, go out larger. See how this, this feather is now pointing back towards here. This next one. So I've got a zone here of fingered tips. But they're not, the wing is not doing this. No, oh, no, 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 no. We're not doing this. Because the wrist is here, those fingers point towards there. So here is the back edge of this wing. And I'm gonna kind of bowl it back in here. Put in a slight curve here. So that's kind of a quick wing. Now let's look what happens when this gets foreshortened. So all the this fingering is happening, look at that, that's just out on this final part of this wing out here. So that means the depth of these in this foreshortened wing is not going to be as great. So I'm going to just give myself a few littler bumps around there. And there's my wing in the background. And that's gonna be even more extreme in this front wing, because look at this. If I just were to go from the wrist here and I were to fan out like this in my primary zone, I'm now going to come in here So the fingering is less prominent here because everything has been foreshortened. And I'm gonna kind of bigger dip in the back. If this bird has its wings down and flapping, I'm gonna back up here, it's gonna be a similar sort of thing. <clears throat> so I'm gonna draw this thing coming towards me a little bit so that you can see the V here in the front of the wing. So the quick and dirty, so you can draw, you know, here's my, my, my critter's body, hawk's body and the wings are coming down from that.
Jack, there's a request. Um, someone's asking if you could put a dot on the model to show where the wrist is. Yes. The wrist is right here on the model. So you see this little kind of dark bar, this patagial mark right up in here is where the bird's wrist is. So if you have this model, it's where those two little dark feathers are. So if this bird is flying along like this, and so it's right at eye level, and it is flying horizontal to you, then you're going to see the wings as being the same length like this. So this is a bird that is flying along, and it's flying horizontal to you. If it's tilted away from you, then notice one wing is long, one wing is short. So the bird can be flying along horizontal to your plane of viewing, in which case you see both those wings the same length, a little bit of tilt, all of a sudden one wing long, one wing short. And if it's tilted, a rock, the back is rocked away from you, then the close wing appears short. If it is rocked towards you, then the back wing can be short, right? So, whoops. So you can either have the wing that is close to you be the long one, or the wing that's further away from you as being the long one. It's just going to depend on how that bird is rocked. So look at this little, um, I've got a hot dog here. And my hot dog has this tent coming up into the middle of it. Let's, if, if, so if this bird were flying horizontal to your plane of, of, of sight, then these two wings are going to appear the same length. But let's just for fun, tilt it. Um, so, uh, Ivea, should we have this bird tilted towards us slightly so that the closer wing is bigger or away from you slightly so that the farther wing is bigger? Which would you prefer? Uh, the closer wing being bigger, please. Closer one being bigger. All right, so what I'm gonna do is just keep this one long and I'm going to stop the other wing here. Now, this one here, it's got primaries and secondaries. This one coming down from here, it's gonna have primaries and secondaries. And so I'm going to come out. And this time without drawing in the fingers, I'm just going to roughly kind of get them to point towards here. And this one, Don't make your bird beaks too big. But wait, there's more. If the bird is doing either a powerful downstroke with its wing, or if the bird is sort of a heavy bird, and so that there's, as it's kind of hanging in the air, there's a lot of force down, um, the air is rushing up past it, <clears throat> these little thin wing, wing tips 
will curl up. So if I look at this from the front, see what I've done? I have tilted, let me put something dark behind it. I have, it's kind of a sign of COVID, right? When the most handy thing to put a dark thing behind it is, oh, let's grab a mask. Um, so see how the, this thing, the wingtip is now tilted up? If you have one of these models, tilt that wingtip up. And let's see what happens when this wing with, with wings with wings up, with wings up. All right? So I've tilted, I've tilted these wingtips up. Right? And in this wing up position, you really can't see any difference it doesn't have an impact. You're still really seeing those wing tips as fingered when they're above the plane of the body. See that? So this, it looks like I really didn't do anything of significance. But wait, let's take those wing tips and flap them down. Now, um, when I flap them down, When those wingtips are pointing towards you, look at this craziness. It looks like I've come along with a pair of scissors and snipped the wingtip off right there. Let's take a look at this far wing back here. All right, I rock it down. I'm going to put that against light colored paper. You see how you don't see the dark wingtips? If I hold it like this, it's got dark wingtips. But like this, that far one, the wingtips are now pointed away from you, and it looks like I've taken a piece of uh, some scissors and cut this thing square across the tip of those feathers. Here on this front wing, you can see those wingtips flipped up, but look at the silhouette of the wing. It's square across the bottom here. Both of the wings that are down, you're seeing that kind of trim look on those wingtips. When both wings are up, you still see the full fingering. Fingers up, cut down. Fingers up, cut down. Let's take this and rock it so that one wing is up and one wing is down. So when I have one wing up and one wing down, notice that the one that is above the plane of the body, the wing up, you see the fingers. The wing down is cut. So in all cases, when the wing is down below the plane of the body, we're seeing this, because of these flipped up wing tips, we're seeing, it gives us this appearance of having the tip of that wing tip cut off. This is a subtle thing. And I want to kind of out myself on something. Hold on a second. I'm going to go grab where is... Hold on a moment. So <clears throat> look at um, so this is is my field guide to the Sierra Nevada. And um, my kind of go-to thing when I made this book, this wasn't really on my radar. Um, and I have, I, I have all of these birds. A lot of them are in kind of a, a, a rocked three-quarter view. 
this one here, I, I, I managed to get it a little bit. But on a lot of these, um, I should have much more kind of cut off on that one that is the below the body plane and rocked away from me. So like, this is a great example here. Look at this turkey vulture. This is, this is, this is, this is it. Here's, here's the mistake. Turkey vultures, their wings are in a big dihedral V. Um, so I should have this wing really noticeably longer than this wing. And you see these, let's zoom down on this. <clears throat> these wingtips here should be flipped up away from me. But I really didn't, I wasn't understanding that at the time that I was doing these illustrations. And even though I was looking at photo reference and sketches and all these other sorts of things, this is such an odd phenomenon that even though I was, it was there on the, 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 the resources in front of me, I, because I expected to see the wingtips like that, I drew them like that. So this is a great example of drawing what you expect to see, not what you do see. And that's why I like playing with a little model like this because I tilt it and I go like, whoa, what happened to your wingtip? That's crazy. That is crazy. Not when I see it, that one, to draw the wing like that, you really have to believe you're foreshortening. But that's actually what you're seeing. So it looks like as somebody cut diagonally back towards the tip of the wing. And it's not just a model, a paper model that does this. Let's go to, Look at this. This bird has wing tips down. You see that big flip up in them? So you can see on this far wing, the reason we're not seeing the tips of those wings is because they're curled all the way the heck up there. And look at this one. These ones, you can see this wing tip flipping up towards you. And that flipping wing um, makes this. These feathers here look really short. So this is pointing up towards you. This is pointing up towards you. These ones are pointing up towards you, less pointing up towards you here, so they don't appear cut off. Both cut, both wings that are down below appear to be cut off. Let's look at another one with that same kind of angle. Look at this. You're not seeing that fingering because these are flipping up towards you. This is not as extreme flip up, but look at how, remember the ones that flip up the most are closer to the front of the wing. Look at this cut off wing right there. Both bottom wings, somebody came along and snipped them there. We expect that to see that full fingering out, but we don't. Now wing tips up, the wingtips, even when they're curled up, they behave the way we expect them to. The wing up, I see the full fingering. Wing up, I see fingering back there and fingering up here. Cool. Look at this. Here's this, and look at this. Here's, this is cool because you've got these really foreshortened wings. Look at the shape of that wing on the bottom compared to the wing on the back. But you see on both of these, you're seeing those wing tips. And as a matter of fact, on the wing that is the closest to you, you're seeing those wing tips even more exaggerated because they are tipped up into the plane that is uh, perpendicular to your line of sight.
Now let's look at one wing up, one wing down. Look at the top wing. It's looking like a diagram of a wing. Look at the bottom wing and it looks like somebody snipped off the tips of those outermost primaries at an angle going towards the head. Same here. Look at that snip in the front. This is a full primary feather right here where my arrow is. Wow. By the way, all these photographs from Vivek Canzode, um, seeing birds, um, oh, sorry, bird pixel is the website um, that all of these came from. Came from. Um, and you can go there and see these and more. The one that is up, you see everybody nice and all those little primary feathers putting on a show. The one that is down below, again, it looks like somebody snipped off the tip of that. <clears throat> so this is something you're going to see all the time, but it is so counterintuitive, it is hard for our brain to grok. And that's why making a little model of the bird and just placing that model on the back of your toilet tank and for a week, just when you have your moment, you just get that off the back of the tank and you look at it for a while and you turn it at different angles with one eye closed. And you look for the surprises. How do those angles look different? Look, look, look at that bottom wing. Isn't that cool? That bottom wing just looks like somebody snipped it off. So now let's take a look at how if I incorporate that into these photographs, sorry, these, these drawings right here, what I would actually see is going to be more like this. because these feathers are actually flipping up towards me. I'm sorry, I want to make this other direction. So I got to remember, I, I, this is sort of a, a new little thing. So these, if these tips here are going to be more easily flipped up, then those are flipping up at an angle that is pointing towards the bird's head. And I don't have to do that up here because these are both above the body, but for these below the body ones, that's gonna be important. Let's do one with a dihedral where we see wings above and below the body. I'm gonna put in a hot dog for my body and I'm gonna have wings coming in like this. Hold on, there's, I, I hear a doorbell ringing and I'm the only one home right now. I need to see if this is something important. Um, uh, Melinda and um, Ivea, could the uh, two of you see if there are any questions that you might be able to field at this point? I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. Let's see. So someone's asking if the tips are always flipped up. Are you talking about the finger fingers, the primary tips of the wings? And I think that will depend on um, how the bird is flying. So I would practice by looking at the bird and observing what the bird is doing. So Jack always says, believe what's in front of you, right? So believe the bird. And so when we're practicing, look at what the bird is doing. So there are a lot of photos. I put the link in there. The, all of the photos that Jack used today are from a great website. It's a friend of his. Um, 
birdpixel.com. So you can go ahead and just click on that and save it and go to that website and check out those birds and practice sketching. This is really hard to understand because it's counterintuitive and the foreshortening and perspective, it just like does a number on your brain. So instead of trying to think of it theoretically, look at the bird, look at the photo and practice from there and you'll start to get the hang of it. That's, that's a really good um, ad ad advice. Um, for us, to, for, for you to have to make up the bird entirely is, is gonna be rough. That's why it, it's great to look at a photograph. It's great to study from the model. And eventually what you'll be able to do is you'll have a bird that will flip past you in flight. And you are going to then be able to reconstruct that based on kind of the theoretical model, but don't start there. So for this bird here, um, this far wing, Is going to be coming down up doing something like this. My close wing, I'm going to cut the tips of this off here. This wing is so, I think that the reason that I first noticed this, um, I'm going to just step across the room here for a second to see if I can, uh, here it is. One of my uh, nature illustration heroes is David Allen Sibley. And one of the, before the Sibley Guide to Birds came out, he illustrated this little thing um, with line drawings and it's this, this guide to hawks in flight, and it's called Hawks in Flight. And, uh, but in that, you know, you'll see all of these little, let me just let's zoom down. These are just these, these little line drawings. And I look at these things and go like, like, whoa, David, what are you, what's up with that wing? Um, Sometimes it's in an illustration. Yeah, look at that. So see that, the, the tip, how the tip of this one, that, that's like, why, why isn't he showing those little wing tips out there on that Harrier? Um, and yeah, look at this one. Why isn't that symmetrical? Why, am, why is he not showing that on that bottom wing? Is that little yeah, cut off? Could you zoom out one notch oh. so we could see the whole bird? Yeah, thanks. Isn't that cool? So he's, um, Sibley was all over these, these, these dynamics of like, look at this drawing. And I would first look at this and just say, why does David Sibley draw his wings weird? The reason is he was drawing things the way the bird actually appears in the air. And what it was, the thing that was weird was my mental model of how that should look. Um, so it, 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 it's taking me practice, but what now what I look at is I try to get myself to the point where I can look at that and accept that and, and understand that as wingtips flipping up towards me. And then when I see the bird fly by, I go like, oh yeah, cut on the down wing. And then I can get that into my sketch. But isn't that counterintuitive? Your brain wants symmetry. 
but um but and it's, it's it's really fun for me that like the, the 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 original insight to this little thing was by looking at david sibley's drawings and it just looked wrong to me and here's this master bird illustrator and drawing these wings with these funky shapes what's going on he was drawing them right and it was my mental model was my mental model that needed to be adapted and revised. Just here's one last one, slight little turn on these exhibitors. Let's zoom back out one level as you suggested. So these bodies are turned toward, turned, this side is turned um, just a little bit away from you. And that gives you that cut on the edge. Isn't that cool? So Jack, we have a question about while you're talking about the wings and the tips and how they look. So um, Amelia is asking whether they're always flipped up. Um, no, that's a great question. No, they're not. So for a lighter bird, especially one that is not in a downstroke, um, they are going to be less flipped up. Um, some birds have stiffer wings. Um, the, you know, if you've ever heard a raven fly by, you hear poof, 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 crazy stiff wings. They don't. They flip up, but not as much. And also, the bird isn't as heavy. Then you take that. That if you have in the same updraft a raven and an eagle flying along in that same updraft. That big eagle is going to have more push up on its wingtips. The raven is going to be more buoyed up. Um, and also, as the wing is flapping, there will be, when you're doing your down flap, you're pushing it up more. On the upstroke, it's not being pushed up. And so, from the upstroke to the top of the upstroke, uh, you're not getting that. Now, let's see, five minutes for the last major concept. Oh, this is gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna try to do it, but it's gonna be, it's gonna end up being doing too much. But here's what we'll do. I'm gonna introduce you to one more idea. And then I will do a future class on drawing seagulls where we will pick this thread up. Um, let me go to this cam here. So <clears throat> we've been keeping our wings flat. We've been, tilted them up into a dihedral. We flap them down. We have that tip, that, that flip up in the tip. But what birds can also do is at that wrist, so that you know how you look at the bird, it looks like its elbow is bent. That elbow in the wing that you're seeing that that joint is actually where the bird's wrist is the bird's wrist the bird's wing can be out like this up with that wing down you know how the the classic draw a seagull right everybody makes an m right or some people go like that a v and then other people go like oh no i also see them making an, an m what it is, is here's the bird's body, there's its wrist, there's its wrist. So let's check out this bird wing. Here's a bird wing. These are my primaries, these are my secondaries. So if it's flat, it's just foreshortening like that. If the wing is bent, then in this view, you are not seeing the primaries, you're just seeing the secondaries. Out like this, you're seeing primaries out here and secondaries down here. But look what happens if I have two wings. Let's see here. There we go. Right. So there's my seagull flying along. Right. And if you look at it from this angle, um, you notice that there is one part of the book up here 
that is pointing away from you that you can't see. You get to see this big side that says science. You don't get to see the side where my chin is, and this other side is now facing towards you. So you don't get a good look at the primaries here. You get a look at the secondaries here. You don't get a look at the secondaries here. You don't get, and then the primaries are not here. So let's let's take this over with the little gall. I'm going to bend the gall's wings down. There's my M. Looking at it straight on the back. And now I rock it this way. Look at what has happened to the size of the primaries on this side. So I see this big sweep of secondaries and just a little thumb of primaries sticking off the back. Meanwhile, over here, I see a huge blade of primaries. And if I hold the wing at the right angle, I can even get it so that you see no secondaries. Looking at it from the belly, I can get the same sort of thing going on here. Or look at how you're seeing all these secondaries in here, and the primaries are now just this little thumb sticking off the back. And what about on that wing down below, right? This, these primaries are turned towards me. I'm getting those secondaries. They're also tucking in behind the body, mostly just sort of seeing primaries sticking out here with a lot of foreshortened secondaries. So a lot of ospreys will really, really bendy wings. You'll see harriers also doing that uh, with their wings, gulls all the time. And so here's our foreshadowing of our gull drawing class. If you were to, to draw this, Um, I'm looking at a, uh, a, a hawk that is, first of all, if, if it's coming, I don't know, coming straight towards me, okay, here's, here's an osprey holding a fish, right? The osprey, got those lines on the side of the head, its legs dangle down, they hold the fish head first so that it's streamlined into the wind. There's an osprey coming towards you. Now let's draw our osprey friend at a three quarter view. Here's its body. And the wings are roughly going to be coming across it at an angle like this. I'm going to look, be looking down uh, at the, the, the back of this thing. Don't know how we got above a flying osprey, but today we did. All right. So straight eagle wings is going to be um, easy. But this wing here, I'm going to be seeing, uh, got this other flying osprey in my way, with real bent wing tips. I'm going to have these primaries up. And then this part here, is so so here's here's the the diagram that I'm going to make of it. Here is this part up, and this part can be down like that, or this part could be out at this angle, or it could just be up here at a foreshortened angle. So you see, if we bend 
this here, this can flip back and forth. Meanwhile, this one here is going to be coming up towards us. And so it appears more foreshortened. And coming down from that, I'm going to have my primaries, this big sheet. Can you slide your paper up just a tad? Oh, sorry. So this long area in here is equivalent to this shorter area in here because this is turned up towards me. So I'm going to now get my pencil in here. and draw in these wings. So birds on the back, there's sort of a pad of feathers right here. You can imagine them kind of like shoulder pads. They're called the scapular feathers. So that tucks over the wing when you're looking at the back. So the wings come under the scapulars. So I'm going to do some big fingering in here. And then I think if this actually gets flipped up, it's going to be cutting those parts there off. So I can then come in here and and then back here. Just you slide your page up just a tad? Thank you. So I think I want this wing to be longer up here. So the... <clears throat> The, the lengths of these different sections in here are going to be kind of appearing and disappearing as the bird, let me grab my gall again, as the bird rocks. Um, so a bird can have, I just don't want to go this way, no, this way. Um, this secondary area here can appear really short. The one on the other side can appear really long. The primaries can be foreshortened out away from me and appear really short. Um, if those are tipped up, I will see the, uh, the, the fingering on them. The one that is down towards me the primaries, I'm going to be seeing those long, the long full face of it, but those get tipped up. So once you kind of add this extra M motion into it, there's, there's just sort of one more plane that is going to be doing foreshortening. So it's not just that the tips of the wings are foreshortening. On, on a bird that is doing it, its wings in an, in an M position, you will also get um, one of the sets of primaries being foreshortened, one of the sets of secondaries being short, foreshortened.
I think I should do a full class where we'll play with rocking a, um, a, a gull around from different angles. Let me just, in conclusion, we're going to drop back to the David Sibley book. And what I'm going to do is, um, we'll just take a look through some of his sketches and just sort of note what is going on. What are the phenomena that are giving you the distortion that you see? This one here, you're seeing this bird pretty much straight from below. The bird is slightly turned away from you, making the primaries on one side, the downside of the body, the bottom side, a little bit shorter. This one is at a big tilt so that the wings are really foreshortened. And again, notice in the very foreshortened wing how there's that big bulge there in the secondaries. Same kind of bird here but you're not seeing that big bulge as prominently because it's spread out over a longer area. On the top, we're seeing the wingtips. On the bottom, we're seeing the cut end. It's interesting. So here, this lower wing, you're seeing a big cut. Um, Sibley has drawn a cut here on this top edge, and I'm not sure why, but my guess is that there's another thing for me to get to understand about these birds that I don't get yet. <clears throat> well, when in doubt, I'm, 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 I'm tending to think that David Sibley is, has, 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 got, has, has got game. Take a look at the bottom wing snipped off. The top wing, you see the feathers. And also notice how angular that top wing is. Slide that down just a little bit, Chuck. Oh, Thank you. Really angular on the top wing, less so on the bottom. Um, Here, these birds have bent wings. So you're seeing real, so this, this wing is, is um, top wing, you're seeing the feathers, bottom wing cut. The wings are at slightly different angles so that um, what you're seeing is more of the, let's just turn, I'll put the gull in the same position as this bird. If I hold back up, back up. Um, I can hold the gull so that the primaries of the bottom wing, I see those big, and the primaries of the top wing, I'm seeing those as small. See that? Because these are turned down towards you, these are foreshortened towards you. These ones are foreshortened so that you see your, your view is perpendicular to the plane of them. And thus, you have this small primary section here because it's rocked down towards you. And large primary section here. Um, I want to finally bounce over to, I'm Jerf Hopkins, not the kite, Northern Harrier. Take a look at, on this bird, the secondaries in here seem really small, big primaries. When you take a look at the bird from the underside, 
you'll see that there's a lot of secondaries and a lot of primaries. So why is it that in this sketch here, the secondaries appear so short? Again, a bird turned with its wings in an M, the bottom wing, you're going to be seeing the primaries full on, but a lot of the, the secondaries, hold on, I gotta sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is again this foreshortening that that it's it's hard for my brain to grok unless I have the bird in my hand like this, and I can turn it and go like, oh, at this angle with a wing and an M, this far wing out here, I'm seeing my secondaries are really foreshortened, and the primaries are not. So that's what you're seeing right there. So that's another way that a, a bird like this can be really useful to you because when you see um, either a photograph or a sketch that doesn't make sense to you, for, for a lot of sketches when it doesn't make sense, the artist may have made a mistake. Um, Sibley's not making these mistakes. He's doing these things on purpose. Final one here, here's a turkey vulture. Compare this turkey vulture with, we're gonna again, just to, to wrap up here, compare it with the turkey vulture that I did. Where's the birds, the birds, 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 birds. All right, and we're gonna go to this, yeah. So side-by-side -side turkey vultures. Um, Sibley has the bravery to draw the wing the way we really see it. And it, it, it is so hard to do that. It's, it's really, really hard to do that because your brain wants to make that symmetrical with that. That's, that, was, that was what I was going on with, with me here in this bird. I, so a couple of kind of classic mistakes. One, I make the head too big. We tend to make the heads too big because heads are cool and I get into drawing the head and then I've got a head that's too big on my bird. But then this, when we're drawing something that is symmetrical, we know it's symmetrical. We want to draw in that symmetry. And, and having the bravery to do something like that, um, I think really shows that you have been spending your time in the field. Um, just one other, I'll show you another field guide that does this really well. Um, if you're looking for bird illustration inspiration, the complete guide to the birds of Europe, there's a smaller version that is a field guide version. Um, this is the coffee table size because it makes the birds bigger. Um, but when I go to the raptors in this, um, you will see that these, uh, so here you're seeing the bird really kind of straight underside view, but look at these sort of three quarter view back views. Right. That's nice. That's really nice. You see the same thing happening here. Compare your top wing with your bottom. Um, here's a nice cutoff wing. Um, let me see if there's just a couple other 
examples. Oh, this is neat. <laughs> like this one here, right there. So the reason that this wingtip here looks so, and this one here, they look like, like what's going on with this? Like why, why do you make this one come to a little point like that? Um, well, there's other winged, there's other feathers that are right in this area that are pointed up towards you. And so that's, there's a little cut. And that will be our story for now. Um, So today's class, so if this is your first class and you're going like, oh man, this is, this is, this is crazy. Um, this is more of an advanced workshop on, on drawing raptors. We're here kind of fine tuning some real subtleties that I did not even have awareness of when I was making my field guides. So cut yourself a lot of slack. Um, there were two other workshops in this series and um, those will be online soon. Um, and so there's a number of people in this class we've kind of built towards this. So this is, we're now kind of getting to an extreme end of, of, of working with these, these, these sorts of details. So cut yourself some slack. If this feels a little bit challenging, um, yes, this is this is one of our more advanced workshops. And, and again, if you're if this is your first one, you'll be you might be sitting there thinking like, "Well, this is this is you know, time out." Um, also, be aware that, as sort of style wise, I kind of sometimes tend to like really go down a rabbit hole and get into a. a really noodly level of detail with, with a small part of a phenomenon. Like I think that these wingtip angles, like I get really excited about it. Is it a big deal? No. And if you don't have that in your drawing, that's okay. And, 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 and also different teachers in our community um, sort of teach and explain things at, at different levels. Um, so if this feels like overly geometrical anatomy sort of thing. Um, I tend to err on that side and other people sort of, and so that's one of my, the disadvantages and one of the strengths of working with me. Um, and other um, educators in our community have different advantages and, and strengths. So I really want to encourage people to kind of shop around and like find the person who's like, this person really works for me. And you will find that person in the nature journaling community. Um, what I want to encourage you to do is to, to print out a little bird model for yourself and play with these, these things, the wings up, the wings down, the, the, the tilting wing tips, how those look at different angles. And then go to, there's a couple of websites that I, I really recommend. One is um, birdpixel.com and seeingbirds.com. They've got great curated collections of birds and birds in flight. And you can use those to help you be able to draw um, from a bird that's not going to be moving, a still photograph. But remember, when you're looking at that photograph, don't just copy it. Get yourself to understand why am I seeing the angles that I am. And then frame that out and feel like, okay, that's cut. It's an angle cut towards the head. There it's that pattern again. You're gonna generalize from those sketches to help you when you're out in the field, then the next time there's a red-tailed hawk um, or a common buzzard, if you're over in Europe, circling over your head, you're like, okay, this is, this is a chance for me to kind of look at these things. And a strategy that Keith Hansen uses when he's looking at a bird in flight, it's moving, 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 moving. You just wanna draw this one moment. You can try this. You close your eyes and then you open them for a moment and then close them again. 
And right there, when you open them for a moment, there's this one little moment of all the angles of that bird in flight that's gonna get burned into your eyes. And you then are going to take that and as quickly as you can, get some marks and lines down on paper. What are the kind of critical things that you're seeing there? Understanding the geometry of the bird is gonna help you kind of frame that. So you're kind of going with, what are you getting in this sort of freeze frame of that bird circling around? couple that with your understanding of the geometry and the anatomy. And you'll be able to draw hawks on flight. They're cool. Birds of prey know they're cool, as Gary Larson told, told us. And they're, they're really fun to draw. Because their wings are so big, we get to really see these angles in their wings. And it's fun to do. I want to encourage you as our spring raptor migration is kicking in to go out and try to find raptors near you and see if you can get some of those into your sketchbook. Again, it's gonna help you to first warm up with the things that you can control, how they hold in the sky and photographs that don't move. But also let's, don't, be, don't shy away from the, the, the birds in the field. And when you see a wacky wing angle, just get it down on your paper quickly. Because if you wait too long, your brain is going to go like, no way did you see that. It's symmetrical, right? So quickly, chugga, 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 chugga. get it down on paper. And then you just have to, hmm, I'm going to trust those lines. Right? And do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. And you're going to get an intuitive sense of, of how these birds are doing their bird thing. And it's going to be fun. I hope this was fun for you. I hope this was useful for you. I hope I didn't go way too um, down this rabbit hole for you today. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again um, here soon. We're now going to jump over to our community cam. And um, if there's any sketchbook pages that people want to, to share, journaling moments, that you want to share, I want to encourage you to do that. Um, there are um, a number of people who do want to share. So just be aware of yourself, of the proportion of time that you are sharing and um, make sure we, get, we give other people in the community um, an opportunity to share as well. And, um, but, but don't not share because you're thinking like, like oh, like I, no, I, I, I shouldn't do this. I'm going to take away somebody else's time. Um, we're all here. We really want to see what you've been up to. Um, so this can be either notes from today's class. It can be stuff from your sketches out. And we're going to start with our friend, Sandra. And um, we're going to, in just a moment, we're going to figure out how to make you able to, you can now unmute yourself. Sorry, I didn't have that turned off. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> that picture of Gary Larson, I had cut out of the Washington Post Sunday section in color. I had it on my refrigerator for years until it fell apart. You know, the dark glasses. Yes, the, uh, that's the, the birds of prey. No, they're cool. And they, some of them have little Walkman. Well, right. I, I just it, it was so, wonderful. It was yeah. love the brain on that guy. Yeah, um, Gary Larson is wonderful. Um, and the pictures you showed of David Sibley's art, that last picture had been cut out of something. I mean, his artwork had been cut out with a knife and had been, it was cut out badly. Um, so it's the short, the four short, four shortened wing was, you know, basically correct, but it had been very crudely cut out. And I don't know why they were do doing that. I could see it in some of the other ones too. Um, well, um, I, 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 are you talking about um, this bird yeah, here? I think so. No, I, I think that this is, this is as, as much as it looks like they're, they're, the, the, this is why this, this business is so counterintuitive. Um, yeah, but 
look at the tail too. I mean, it just looks like somebody worked on it. That, 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 that may be. Um, he does have a crisp hard line around the edge of the entire drawing and I see that going around. I don't see a place where somebody else kind of cut that line out. If it had been, um, if, if it had been, I think we would, I would see um, that outside edge line, his crisp outside edge line um, removed. But I'm seeing that throughout the, the entire thing. I believe that this is, this is, this is the way that he drew it. And, but it is such a counterintuitive thing. It looks like way too harsh. There's no way you could have that much foreshortening I, I and agree. tail flip and wing flip up. Um, but that's because my brain is wanting to keep the symmetry of those two wings. And um, I, I think that he's drawing the bird the way that it, um, that you really can um, see it in flight. Well, next time you see him, you ask him if they cut his birds out with a knife for publication to do a paste up. Is that an old book? This is this is an older book. Yeah. Well, um, printing methods have changed. I, I will I will find out um, <laughs> the. Uh, that, that's, but it's, it's, it, it, it is such a, it, for me, it's really mind bending trying to kind of get into this, this foreshortening of the wing. My brain wants to keep the symmetry of those two wings so strongly that I'm I have, on. ah, there we go. Those are our buddies. Yep. Yep. I see what you mean, but thank you. Thank you. And birds of prey are cool. Birds of prey, no, they're cool. They absolutely are. <laughs> That's right. Um, thank you so much. Um, let me take a look here. Um, and if you would, uh, Margarita, I'm going to jump over to you. We're going to uh, head over to Mexico. It is really good to see you. Thank you. It's always good to see you and everybody else. And Thanks so much for these classes and just your encouragement for all of us during COVID. It's been wonderful. But I wanted to share that uh, yesterday I joined the um, showcase with the uh, veterinary school at UC Davis. And they went through four programs of where they're doing research around the world with different animals. And I used some of the techniques from Wild Wonder as well as what you're doing to um, capture sketchings with my notes to help me remember all that I'm learning on the research of these different animals. So um, I, I would have never thought to have done that. Whoops, that's today's lesson. This is the whales. Uh, but yes. we, went to, we went to Patagonia, we went to um, Uranda, and um, where, where else did we go? Rwanda and Uganda on gorillas. We went to a rapture center and uh, we did a, a cougar study that they're doing on, and they talked about all the research that they're doing on preservation, rehabilitation, um, with the cougars, with the uh, inbreeding is really decreasing the population. And interesting, several people have been writing and we've been talking about the seagull, the right whales in Patagonia, the threat to them is seagulls. The seagulls are pecking the uh, backs of calves to get to the blubber and they're causing stress and um, the calves are not able to rest. And so gulls, seagulls are decimating the, the whale population down there in Patagonia. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Yeah. Oh, wow. But thank you for this technique. I, I really had fun. And it, it's hard to do because the slides and pictures were moving so fast, you know, because they really wanted to talk about the research, not really the actual animal, like what we're looking at. Um, yeah, <clears throat> but but what's what's interesting when you do do this kind of sketch noting, mm -hmm. um, and again, everybody check out Mike Rohde's book, the Sketch Note Handbook. Um, yes, he talked to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your memory of this. Um, people would say like, but then you're distracted while you're seeing this talk. No, but when the talk is over, because you did this, you have all this stuff 
vividly in your mind. Mm -hmm. And people who are just sitting there kind of watching have already forgotten um, by the time they get onto the whales, they've forgotten everything they learned about the cougars and the gorillas and the toucans. That was exactly what I was thinking about yesterday. So I decided to just open up my journal and take my notes in this at the same time. So I really want to applaud and thank you for giving us this uh, gift of learning to do this. That's, that's terrific. That's terrific. And mm -hmm. again, I want to urge everybody to check out um, Mike Rohde, Sketchnote Handbook, um, and what, doing what Margarita is doing um, in these, uh, these sort of quick notes, these visual note taking during anything that you want to retain the information. Really, really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. You. Um, we are now going to go visit our friend Amelia. And um, hey there, it's good to see you. Let me spotlight you. Box is up. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Okay, so I just want to quickly show what I did um, like a few days ago. It's just in my backyard. So I was drawing this plant and then I, um, I was kind of picking it from the ground to, to see it in detail. And then I put it on the ground and stepped on it and then made a mark. So I decided to try rubbing it on my <sighs> paper and then um, it left this green mark, which is kind of cool. Oh, what a good idea. And you mm -hmm. figured that out your, um, your, yourself. That's really, really mm -hmm. cool. And then um, our, our chickens, I was drawing our chickens. It's kind of hard because they're constantly moving um mm -hmm. but but it's one thing that's easy about chickens is they're always like <laughs> so they're moving suddenly so it's kind of easier because of that and as also i had a question oh, but, but before you go on to the question oh. can i just uh point out something that you did on that page that i want to encourage other people to do um so amelia's got the challenge of these chickens are moving 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 let's hold that page up again notice the way that she solved that problem is by having multiple poses and you can have these going at the same time so a side view notice there's a side view going right side view going left front view so when the chicken moves to a different position she can just jump over to a drawing that she's already started and continue on that Another thing that she's doing that is very useful here um, is that she has an enlargement of the head. So a part that you want to focus on, you don't have to do the entire bird, just take some little part. And if the body's moving, you just can follow, you're now following a smaller target and it makes it easier to work on a moving subject. So a part of the moving object and getting a right, left, front. Sometimes people do right, left, front, back or a three quarter view. So you can get those multiple drawings going at the same time. That's an awesome strategy for handling things that are moving. Another thing hey, is- I, I just wanna say, can I just jump in, um, Jack? Uh, Amelia yes. started coming to my workshops last year and I haven't seen her in a while. I just wanna real quick say how um, you, the improvement you've made, Amelia, with your sketching and observing and writing all those notes and your observations, it's pretty amazing. It's so fun to see you really exploring nature that way. So I just wanna give you a high five. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just want to say one more thing before my question, just yes. so other people here. Um, I another thing you could do is you can always write down sounds. Like I wrote down that one of my chickens called Peppercorn said, Brr, and then one of my chickens, well I don't know which one, was like, <laughs> like a funny <laughs> sound. So one one was one is more of a brr and the other is a. Brr. Sort of with a rising note in it? Well, kind of. So sometimes they sometimes they just go like straight, like brr or brr or something. But um sometimes they go brr, brr. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, that's really cool. But can I ask my question really? Absolutely, quick? absolutely. So I was wondering when you cut off the edges of the wing, oops, when you cut off the edges of the wing, 
can you sort of let me just quickly draw can you draw them in curling up oh yes like yes this? yes can you draw them curling up absolutely absolutely um so when it's really far away we can't really see that on one that is closer to us we're going to see that that wingtip curling up um, so I'll do a little sketch of that. That's a great question. Um, let me jump over to the document camera and so We have body. I'm going to give it a little head, and here's its undertail coverts. Um, its wing. Um, if I'm looking more down on the back, I sometimes want to think of this actually as a three-dimensional thing, sort of with you know, there's the back, the top of the back of the thing, you know, the. So you can think of this as as a as a three-dimensional thing, kind of turning around this corner here, right? <clears throat> Um, the wing is going to be attached in this area here. My wing here is coming down and um, this line here, keeping parallel with that. So this line of the body, I'm keeping parallel with the line of the tip of the wing here, the line through here. My secondaries are all in here. My primaries are going to be fanning down this way. And I'm going to cut off the tip of the wing. And again, the, the ones out here towards the front are going to be the ones that are going to be primarily flipping down, flipping, uh, flipping up. And so I'm making a diagonal line cutting off that front corner of the wing. These are the ones where that's the area where they're going to be flipping more. And so for the di more distant bird, I'm coming in here to the wrist. I'm just coming across like this, back of the wing here. So for a distant bird, I might just leave it like that. But if this critter is closer to me, I can think of like, I actually am going to be seeing some wing tips that are flipping up in here. Here are my scapular feathers. That was a great question. And it also kind of shows me that you are, you're understanding the ideas and, and, and paying attention to it. You wouldn't have asked that question if you didn't really understand what is kind of going on with these, these geometries. So that's great. Mm -hmm. did, did this help? Yeah, really. <laughs> Hey, uh, uh, Amelia, it, it, it's, it's really uh, great to see you. I, I want to um, also uh, recognize um, uh, teacher Melinda um, for uh, really glad that you had a chance to, to, to work with her. Um, the, the stuff that you, I saw in your journal there uh, really, really like your approach and, and what you're doing very useful strategies for handling those moving things and i also really like the way you're you're using all of your senses not you're using your eyes but you're also listening um that strategy that you had of getting the rubbing of that plant really creative thing to have in your journal so you know where we can we can get rubbings from things um, you can smear dirt 
the, you know, we were in a place like, wow, the dirt here is so red brown. You can smear some of that in your journals. You can, um, if you're drawing a berry, why not crush some of the berry um, and, or even paint part of your object with juice from the berry. Um, so there's lots of kind of applications for the, 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 your, the creative approach that you are demonstrating in your journal there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Ray Bonto had his hand up and there's two other Valters and Lucia as well. Okay. I'm going to need to log off, Jack. So everyone have a great week. Uh, uh, Melinda, thank you so much for yeah. being with us. Sure. I really appreciate that. Um, all right, I am going to find, ah, uh, Ray Bonto. Uh, we're going to go Ray Bonto, then um, was it Lucinda and Walters? Um, hey there, it's good to see you. Thank you for staying up so late to uh, join us. Uh, where exactly? Well, uh, isn't it, uh, it, it's rather late at night where you are right now, isn't it? No. Oh, uh, okay. It's just nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. Okay. So you haven't gone to bed. Yet. All right. I thought you had to, to, to say, it was when we had things at, at three o'clock our time that you had to, to really, the, okay. So um, how are you doing? What have you been up? What's been happening in your journal? We're really excited to see. Oh, well, I had gone crazy today. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get off the screen here. So there's more room. Um, yes, go for it. Yeah. So. Yes. Yes. I can just see your thinking on the page here. Yeah. So. There were, uh, so I decided to put that. Uh, that. Uh, the, what was this word called? Uh, uh, the, the, that big black and white one with the, the huge beak? Uh, no, the one with the huge beak. The, 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 which one? The brown one with the huge beak. The brown one with the huge beak. Um, let's see. We might have to uh, ask Vivek Kanzode. Uh, oh. I, uh, that might have been a, 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 a tawny eagle. Um, but I'll have to, we'd have to take another look at it. Uh, okay. Whatever it was, I decided to uh, make some multiple drawings of the wings on, on it. Um, yes. Yeah, so, oh, that's cool. And you're doing the 3D thing where you're looking in and looking at what the bones are doing, aren't you? Yes, I'm looking at the bones. Ah! <laughs> so everybody check this out. Uh, Ray Bonto has got color-coded bird wing bones going on in his that little diagram that he's made. Right, tell us more. Show us more. Uh, I I decided to use dark brown. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and I stopped using my dark brown pencil, uh, and I decided to use a mechanical brown pencil. Ooh, show us. So, yesterday, I got my first clutch pencil. Yep. Um, those fat pencils. So, it's a coiner, um, versatile thing, and it's very fat. Oh, um, wow. Yep. Yeah. 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 And you don't click it to get out the lead. You click it, and then this will open up, and it, this the lead will become loose, and then you can pull it out. For, so, oh, yeah, you can just, or uh, when you're in the field, this could break, so you can make it disappear inside. No, that's really smart. I like that, and uh, you can have the the brown colored lead stick yeah i i use um geoconda 
lead, uh, 2B graphite, and dark brown. All right. And and what is the um what what is the name of the pencil? Uh I was wondering. Koinor. It's a Koinor. Cool. So the, yeah, this kind of a tool is called a lead holder. Um, oh. That's cool. That's so you've got a nice lead holder, and I didn't know that they made uh, that using the brown um, the uh, lead in that is a great idea. I didn't know such a thing existed. That's cool. Yeah, um, it was just at my art supply store. Uh, I found it, and then I found the lead next to it. Great. They were selling dark brown and charcoal and to be lead, so I got the to be and the dark brown, and also some red lead which I didn't get, uh, so yeah, and then uh, today I went to the park and I managed to improve layout a bit. Oh, yeah. I, like I the... used dark brown. Oh, was, was that with that new dark brown pencil? Yes. Oh, that's fun. That's really fun. Yeah, this uh, was dark brown, even though it's black, um, is dark brown. This is dark brown, this is dark brown, and these two are 0. 0.7 pencils. I mean, 0. 0.7, and that's dark brown alone. Uh, I found a spot. A really nice, nice value, nice, dark, dark, rich value. I found an insect nest. I didn't see the insect, but they probably haven't hatched. Oh, to hold hold that a little bit closer to the the screen. Let's take a. Oh wow! Um, did it seem to be more papery or made out of mud? It seemed fluffy, uh, woolly, and stuff really like that. Interesting. I wonder who's going to hatch out of that. That's mm. cool. Uh, I'd better have a look. Uh, I do draw birds in flight. Um, yeah, and I uh, see. And and those those quick in flight sketches also show the anatomy of you understand primaries and secondaries. Um, that's cool. That's really cool to see. Yeah, and I've got some black hole news for you if you like. Oh, yes. What's the latest from your study of um, black holes, relativity, and space? Well, I don't have the sketch note with me, but I can tell you the news. Black, supermassive black holes are super massive. Um, well named. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, then... Our black hole in the center of the Milky Way is called Sagittarius A star, and it's about uh, four, uh, one solar mass is the mass of the sun. Uh, in astronomy, we, use, we have to use what we have, and the biggest thing we've got around us is the sun, so one solar mass is the mass of the sun. Yeah. Uh, but Sag Sagittarius, now, small black holes, uh, are up to a few times the mass, so uh, up to a few solar masses to only 10 kilometers. Right. So how, how does, um, how does the, uh, sort of in terms of relative mass, how does say a supermassive black hole compare with, um, with, with, with other black holes? Uh, is it like 10 times more, a thousand times more? What, what sort of order of magnitude? Are, do, you, do you know anything? Any, any, uh... All right. A normal black hole, which is 10 kilometers across, it will be definitely million, uh, billions of times that. Okay. So by, by 10, are you saying that its event horizon would be um, 10 kilometers across? Uh, it's mass. I mean, uh, okay, I, all right, I've been, uh, so it's, I don't know how big its mass is, but its diameter is 10 kilometers, but a huge one, uh, um, who, um, 
will be millions of times more than that. Millions. <clears throat> that's that. That's a whole lot of black hole going on. Um, yes. Have you been sketch noting these? Yeah, I don't have the page with okay. me. Next time, we'd love to check that out. That'll be really cool to see. We'd love to see your yes. your evolving astronomical understanding. That's cool. A star weighs in at four million solar masses. Yeah, you're not going to be pulling away from that gravity well anytime soon, are you? No. <laughs> no that's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Then, okay, uh, but compared to the largest, it's space. Andromeda's black hole is a hundred million solar masses. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that this, and then then you think about just sort of imagine space time that you know the image of the fabric with these places where just these incredible gravity wells. Um, what a wonderful thing to visualize. And um, then um, the next black hole, I think it's OJ two eight eight seven two eight seven. Uh, I have forgot the number. Um, that galaxy. Uh, it's got a supermassive black hole, which is 18 billion solar masses. Where is that? Uh, in some galaxy, uh, other galaxy. Wow. Um, this is this is fun. This is really what? fun. So so next time, please bring some of your sketch notes. We'd love to check those out. Um, I'm about to jump over to um, uh, Lucia. Uh, um, the one last thing? Yes, please. Uh, but uh, this is the record black hole size. They're, 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 it's bigger than that? Yes. 21 billion solar masses. You know, it's, it's interesting, like the number of billion is, it's, it, it itself is so large that my brain cannot visualize a billion. I can visualize a hundred. I can visualize what a thousand geese look like. A million, my brain starts to kind of go like, uh, I really don't. And when the time you get to a billion, you might as well be saying like, la, 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 la. Because my, there's this, this, this phenomenon called innumeracy in which, you know, we, numbers get so big that human minds cannot comprehend them. Um, and what's, what's interesting is like the debt that we have here in the United States, it's in the trillions and not even the most, uh, our finest mathematicians can visualize and mentally grok a trillion. Um, and oh. it is, yeah, these, these, these large numbers get so, but that's, that, is, that is a whole bunch of black hole going on. So thank you so much for sharing that. A hundred light years, uh, that means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to jump over now to uh, uh, Lucia and then Walters. Um, thank you very much for sharing that. It's really good to see you. And we are, oh, hey there. Hi. Good to see <laughs> yeah, you. I, I've been, um, I just want to say how much I appreciate your classes. I've been going for a while, but this is the first time I'm um, asking you something, I've got my whole family here today with me, actually, and <laughs> <laughs> my other daughter's over there, but we just love your, I love your classes. I've been going um, for a while, and I apply a lot of what you've te taught to just daily life in general, and it's helped me a lot. Um, but um, today, I have my family, so my daughter um, actually has a has some photos and it, it applies to today's class because she oh. did see a type of raptor right outside her window and um, we have some photos. Maybe we can right. screen share. I, I am about to make you a co-host. Oh God. Oh. <laughs> and so you are now co-hosts with the program. Melinda has dropped out. Um, and I am going to remove my spotlight and we would love to see okay. um, what you did. Yeah, she got some great photos. I'm going to try to do that now. Yeah. Uh, how do you do it? Yeah, share screen. Yeah, I got really lucky because um, 
uh, the, the bird was right outside of my window. Hello. Oh, we have to turn on. Yeah, Give sure. us a second. We have to turn on the ability to screen share. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, not maybe right here. Hmm. Um, so yeah. where, um, where, uh, here, here we, we go. go. Sorry, really, can, can you guys see, can it? see it? Oh, yes. Yeah, but where, I, I live in Marin. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, I'm very lucky. I live like pretty close to like a trail. There's like quite, quite a lot of fauna around, but yeah, he or she just like plopped himself right outside my window and I got really lucky. And because the photos, I was able to see that they're also uh, tagged. Oh. Yeah, I can't, we can't really read the tag, but we just see it's there. It might be silver. Yeah. 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 But, but would you have any idea what this is? Yeah. What is it? I, I, absolutely. So we're, st um, for starters, you have a, um, it's got a very long tail and mm -hmm. it has this, um, red brown chest pale throat dark hood dark gray back in the tail we can see there are also stripes and the this is a an adult what's called an accipiter so accipiter means a, a forest hawk or bird eating hawk they're small hawks that um that are really, really good at catching other birds in flight. And so they will chase after them. Oh. The, this one may even have been banded on uh, Hawk Hill in Marin County, although the birds, raptors can really travel all over the crazy place. But there's a, a wonderful bird banding site just on uh, next to the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, if you're yeah. in, in Marin, that's a, it's a wonderful place to visit during the hawk migration. Um, there are two, uh, this, this we also can tell is an adult, that red brown color mm -hmm. with the slate gray back is the patterns for an adult. If this were a juvenile, it would have a brown body with, with sort of blotchy, blotchy brown and tan and, and, and white on its body. And its eye would be yellow, would have a yellow iris. And if you look really carefully on the one on the right, you can see actually some red in its eye. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we were noticing that. That is like, yeah, a little bit red also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then there are two types of accipiters that um, we commonly have. And one is called the Cooper's hawk, and one is the sharp shinned hawk. Oh. And the sharp shinned hawks are a little bit smaller. The Cooper's hawks are a little bit larger. They're very, very similar looking birds, though. Um, so some people will just sort of stop at saying, you know, it's an accipiter. But on this one, um, there is there's there's a there's a couple of things which we can see. One is that the gray on the top of its head kind of comes smoothly down um, towards the back. And it's the same color on the, sort of the back of the head as it is on the top of the head. Do you see that really well on the right one where that kind of gray color is coming smoothly down? The Cooper's hawk, the larger hawk, has a much darker crown that has a strongly contrasting um, sort of base at the nape. So the, the crown con contrasts with the, the back and the nape. So you'd see a darker crown on the top. Another thing that is sort of a, makes me think uh, the, the sharp shinned hawk, which is the other type, so there's the coopers and the sharp shinned, is that if you look at the height, the length of those tail feathers, they're all basically stopping at about the same point. And the on a um, Cooper's hawk, the inner tail feathers, so the ones that are on the top of, uh, so, uh, uh, are, are sort of on the bottom of the pile, 
when you look at it from the underside. Um, or the ones on the right and the left, the outer tail feathers would be much shorter than the ones at the tip so that you'd sort of see more staggered lengths. So when this one flies around, the tip of that tail looks fairly flat. One other um, kind of thing that is sort of a Cooper sharp shin thing is that the, the Coopers sort of feel to me like they've got bigger feet. So this to me looks like a sharp shinned hawk. And um, without, we could probably, let's see, I'm guessing that is, is that in a liquid amber? The tree that it's in? Oh, oh, the tree. You, you would know better <laughs> than me. No, oh. um, uh, here, I can zoom out on one of them. Um, yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> I'm, if that's a liquid amber there, with that being a liquid amber pod. Oh, yeah. I also forgot to mention really quick that there's a nest that's been here for about a year that was just left over. It's quite big. So I don't, I don't know if that's related at all, but. Um, if that's a liquid amber pod, um, which is about an inch long, then this is a fairly good sized sharp shinned hawk, which makes me think that it may be a female because female hawks are larger than males. Um, wow. When it's looking up like that, I wonder if it's just keeping an eye out for um, for other hawks. If you're a hawk, you don't want to become food for another hawk. So you'll see sometimes um, uh, all the birds of prey, as they're sort of sitting around on the ground or a branch, you'll see them look over their shoulders and then look up into the air because they don't want to be on somebody else's plate except the big eagles. Um, they're so big, they know nobody's going to mess with them, so they don't have to worry about <laughs> becoming somebody else's dinner. Um, I wonder if that's what's going on. I don't know, but it's fun to fun to speculate. That's a, those are wonderful photographs. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank you so thank much you. for the information. That was that was great. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Lucia, it would be fun to do some sketches from these. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and um, and I want to encourage you to share those on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page. Oh yeah. I'd have to get a Facebook account <laughs> first, but yeah. Okay. Uh, your, 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 your daughter might have one that could post it for you. I got it. You can hook, <laughs> hook mom up there. Uh, I got you, I got you. That's great. So yeah, your daughter's got your back. Um, when you need tech support, uh, right there. <laughs> yeah, we always go to her. But thank you so much for everything you, you do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being part of this community and, and, and sharing. It is, um, being able to connect with people like this is what's gotten me through this pandemic. Um, so I really appreciate it. And I'm so happy that it's been useful to you. It's really nice to meet you. Thank you so much for, for coming on with us. Thank you. <laughs> um, so now um, I'm going to jump over to uh, Volters. Are you still in the house? Yes, there you are. Um, Walters, it's really good to see you. And um, uh, yeah, how have you been? Uh, what? It's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. So these are just the one to do do a quick share of what I've been doing. I found a pair of gray wagtails. Uh, that are that little gonna tail be bob that you're showing in there that's really cool yeah that's that's the cool tail bob that they do always that's why they're called wagtails because they always wag their tails so yeah and i really like this one i did i kind of zoomed it out and just looked at it without binoculars and it was uh i like this one a lot that's right and because because wagtails are real walkers so some birds yes. bounce and the wagtails walk. So everybody hold that up again. Everybody take a look at this. Just how much information is held in this little sketch here. It's tremendous. You can see that it's walking around. Um, that's really cool to see. That's really cool to see that the, the, the wag, 
the the also the the non-conventional views we've got a three-quarter view from the back we've got a direct front view in addition to the side wow that's that's really fun to see yeah so it was a uh, it you can always see them uh, here here in europe but uh, usually they breed by uh like rapids rapid waters and uh, uh, by waterfalls so it, i've never seen a pair before i've seen individuals but uh, it was cool to know that they're going to be probably nesting there so yeah and uh, they're gonna, so you're, there's going to be a lot more sketches to come with this by the end yes. of summer you're going to know that species so well yeah definitely is that i also a put the put the i have two nest boxes out for uh, these guys in a river nearby so hopefully you're gonna also go in there nice nice uh, the, you're you make the environment around you um uh, just so much richer was that a grebe that i saw on the other page oh uh, yeah well these were just i was uh kayaking with uh, my little boat around and I just did a quick few sketches uh, didn't time to write anything down just uh, simple is that great crested uh yes yes I think that is the English name oh, yeah great that, crested that's grip. neat that's so cool look at that back view with those crests sort of sticking up see this is yeah. this is the kind of nature journal sketch that these are just so much fun like this back view where you've got these these tufts coming off of the thing you sort of see how this um it's sort of it's just a little sketch you get so much so everybody um you know, here also we're seeing multiple views of the same thing. You know, here's this 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 back view, back with the head turned, or side view. Um, depending on what the bird gives you, take it and bring it the page down just a second, uh, just a few in, uh, just a, uh, other direction, just down a little bit more, down, 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 down right, no, uh, down. Like more. that. Yep. I see. I love that little uh, back end of the bird going into the cavity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his butt was just sticking out. It was, I uh, I don't know if it was cleaning out a cavity or was it gathering nest material for uh, another uh, site that it has a nest in, but it was always just like this and I just fast stitched that this is a crested tit that we have here, yeah. That's cool. That's really yeah. cool. And uh, one other thing I saw that last time, for example, uh, Ray Bondo asked uh, what what uh, telescope or uh, spotting scope uh, you Jack have, and I maybe for some others who are looking, I could recommend this as it's very small, oh, and yeah. I just love this thing so. Mm, you know, uh, usually I go nature journal and buy a bike or on foot, and then there are those big spotting scopes, which is just a hassle to carry around. And you also, if you have a spotting scope, you also have to carry around a tripod. And this is just, it's small. This is A4 paper. This is just small. You, you see like Ray Bondo picking up yeah, That's a yeah. Big for, for, for contrast, and yeah, and this one, it, it in low light conditions because this is so small, it's not very good. But mm -hmm. um, also, in this is two parts. Good. So the spotting scope and this eyepiece, the eyepiece yeah. is also very important. So the 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 zoom on your eyepiece goes from what to what? Uh, I think it goes from twelve to thirty. Thirty. Twelve to thirty. Yeah, that's that's great. So, but um, you what is the, get, what is the model of that spotting scope? Yes, it's the Opticorn MM four five zero ED. So, so I'll hold that up. So, Opticorn MM four fifty ED. Can you type that into the chat? Um, yes, sure, I will. So, I recommend for you to check it out, right, Bonto, because. Uh, I saw your interview with uh, Marley Pfeiffer, 
and there on the on the YouTube first page there was uh, you sketching on your bike. Uh, you're having your nature journal on your bike, so I think this would be very useful for you. Uh, it's very small, and it's uh, definitely you can see much more than with uh, binoculars with this and. Uh, and also for birds of prey, it's it's good if birds are migrating, you just get a chair, point it upwards, put it on your tripod and just look into it and uh, see all the birds. Then just, if you do this all the time uh, with your binoculars, you'll get a war warbler's neck, I think that's called. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps I could get a small tripod for it too. Mm -hmm. And then I could get that. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a great Something idea. Very similar. And, and uh, you know, there are telescopes that have greater magnification, but then you add so much more weight into them. So I'm, I'm with you on that, Walter, is that the small, the small portable scopes are a great way to go. So in my, my closet over here, um, I have a big telescope. And it's a big spotting scope. Um, and then I have um, in my car right now, there's a small spotting scope. And the small spotting scope now goes everywhere with me. And if you travel, you can bring it there. You can bring it on your bike. You can throw it in your backpack. You'd be willing to carry it up to the top of the hill and back the other one. You're just like, uh, I think I'm going to leave it here. Yeah, I had, I had another one, which was like this so yep. big for a long time. I just... Uh, uh, my parents gifted this uh, for me, and I just I just saw that one, and because I I love this thing, it's uh, it's very good. I watch seabirds migrating with it, and I can take it. Uh, uh, you know, for example, if you go on hikes up a mountain, usually just take your binoculars, but this is just so light and easy to carry. You just if you see a bird more distant away, you have a scope with you, so. Uh, and drawing with scopes so much easier. You have your hands free all the time. You just look. Yes. Yeah. So definitely yes. do it. And okay. somebody asks, "Have it good? Has it uh, good clarity?" Uh, yes, it's uh, it's uh, it doesn't work very well in low light conditions, like in sunsets or uh, sunrises. But once it gets a bit lighter. Uh, it works better but ultimately if you go for bigger diameters here it's going to get expensive get expensive and three thousand four thousand five thousand it's uh, going to get big so it brings the cost way down portability way up um should you um you know fall off a cliff and need both hands to hold on and your telescope tumbles down to the bottom you haven't lost thousands of dollars um, so it is replaceable, but they're also because it's lighter, should it fall over, it's less likely to get seriously damaged. So my little scope the other day, it took a header and landed on concrete. And I thought my scope is destroyed. I put it back up, look through it because it's just a lighter scope. It's, I guess it's terminal velocity is not as, 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 as the, um, it, it, it doesn't, it, it's still going. Perfectly fine. Yeah. And, and yeah. Ray Bonto, are you going to say? Yeah, a spotting scope is great because in binoculars, you have to look up like you have to turn around and then find the object and then go down by memory or you have to do a, a blind contour, uh, which I don't do in the field. Uh, but, um, uh, but with the spotting scope, you can uh, just sit there you don't have to hold it with one hand and um, you uh, while you're doing you might just pick it up and turn it uh, while the bird moves but um yes and you can use both hands to draw one eye on the spotting scope and the other eye on your book you're you're so right i mean you don't you're not doing this down draw 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 that, that this oh there it is again the spotting scope stays on the bird you kind of glance up through it and then you're down to drawing glance up through it, you're down to drawing. It's, yeah. and also when you're looking through binoculars, because you're looking through two lenses. You see 3D. Yes, you see 3D, yeah. which means you're also seeing the same bird from two angles. Mm. And your brain splices those together. And then when you are 
transferring things to paper, you're only drawing 1D, you only, I mean, sorry, 2D. So yeah. the piece of paper is 2D. When you look through a telescope or a spotting scope, what you see is 2D. So your brain doesn't have to do the 3D to 2D translation. That's why it's so much easier to draw from a photograph. It's 2D to 2D. But if you're yeah. going from life or through binoculars, you're going 3D to 2D, your brain has to make that translation. Your cognitive load is less when you're drawing through a telescope. That's huge. Mm. Yeah. Definitely agree. It is easier to draw through a telescope. I put the name uh, of the model in the chat, so you can uh, go check it out. But it, it's a really good scope. Almost every bird watcher here in Latvia uses it also. So. Oh, that's great. Tested. It's tested. It is. It is. Yeah. It is. It is Latvia tested. And Latvia tested. That's uh, awesome. We got you. you got her back. You got her back. Another thing with binoculars is that uh, look at one hand and close one eye on the other, it might go around and you have to use one eye to look even though the other eye is on, on the lens because the bird will go from slightly different angles. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, Jack. Thank this you. Lesson. Very That's useful. Really I'm going to sleep now. It's past midnight. So. Oh, man. Hey, it's really good yeah. to have you with us. Um, you take care. Thanks for uh, staying up and sharing with us. Um, it's, it's, it's great to see you. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye good night. Bye. Um, I'm uh, jumping over to the gallery. Um, um, let's, ah, Nicholas, let's see what... Oh, I'm oh I've got owl envy already and you're not even on the big screen. Oh yeah, let's let's see this larger. Um Hi everyone. So I'm putting it closer to the camera. Uh, and uh I wanted to actually share that with you because it links to uh, the, the workshop you did today. And then it's uh, now that is um, in the part of a forest that is uh, quite mature, old growth forest, and uh, we are uh, working on it to protect it. And then we have like big M locks everywhere, like huge ones. We are not even able to circumvent it. And um, I established a plot for monitoring biodiversity there with cameras, uh, audio recorders, and uh, different type of samplers uh, as a part of a project with uh, many other countries. And uh, in the middle of the plot, there's a, just shortly after it was established, and there were two owls singing to each other. So I was very excited. And maybe, That's uh, great. Uh, and I maybe found the spot for the nest. It's like a huge, um, I think the biggest tree in that forest, a big old uh, uh, yellow birch. And, uh, and then he was uh, zooping around, facing uh, in flight or uh, downwards going. And then I tried to capture when he was going that you have these negative shapes that I, I think that's, I wanted to capture the essentials. Like just- yes. Oh, that's such a good strategy. So is everybody seeing this? So to get those, the, 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 how this bird kind of connects together. Uh, Nicholas is really focusing on the negative shape. So he's not looking at the shape of the owl where the detail is. He's looking at the shape of the air next to the owl. And that's what is carving that air, that, that bird in the air for him. That's really cool. That's really cool. And then uh, the lesson of today also like uh, with this, uh, maybe uh, like just adjust a bit the, the last wing here where it's, in fact, you just see the tip. And then I have a hard time, in fact, uh, really capture when the feathers are not separated, like the primaries, when you have a really a round shape, then it's a little bit even more tricky to see what angle it would be at the end. Yeah, and, and also, the, you know, the, on, a, on a bird that is just, it is flapping around, um, you know, it's so different than sketching something from a, um,
from a photograph because the, the tip of the wing is moving the fastest. And, you know, so don't, don't expect yourself to have to get some sort of freeze frame, um, like supervision. Mm -hmm. um, that's really cool. And that, that, that view, just the, the simple shapes of the, this, the view on the side there, and where you see the edge of that facial disc wrapping around and that angle in it. That's a really cool view. That's a really cool yeah, view there. This one, yeah. It was like uh, uh, when I went to take uh, um, one of the sample over there, it's it's um, automatic uh, spore sampler, so I can know which uh, plants are blooming around and uh, which, which uh, fungus are flying out of the air. And then uh, it was just slipping on top of the tree just above that sampler. And it was just like, I think uh, taking a nice nap there. That's neat. And so this is a, a, a dark, really dark-eyed owl. Is that um, is that Ural? Uh, no, it's uh, it's the um, uh, the barred owl. The, the bard. Yeah. So the bard and is also over there on your continent. Uh, yeah, and then it's uh, also um, uh, this in this region. It's. Um, it's like uh, towards a grayish, whitish instead of brownish color. So it's um, it's kind of neat. Yeah, I like it. Oh, that's really fun. That's really cool. And I had a question. Uh, in fact, uh, and then uh, it's linked to uh, the the last drawing you did um, uh, with the exercise of uh, the ML, uh, when Emily asked you the question about how to to do the the feathers or how they the curve upwards. Um, then I wanted to understand, uh, for example, if we could use maybe some of the uh, the reasoning behind uh, you know this exercise you did for the plants and the flowers when you have like uh, the iris uh, with the three D and then maybe the uh, the plastic uh, 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 ziplock that you use for curvatures and and that and maybe that could be a way to understand how the feathers are going and uh, are moving around. Yes. Um, another thing that you could do on that is just with, let me, I'm going to add this in on spotlight here. And I, I did uh, also the picture for the Lucia that uh, Lucia shared with uh, her daughter. That I yes, I saw that. Capture it. Yeah. So it's That's cool. a nice picture. That's beautiful. Um, so when you just take a look at the one that is coming close to you, if you have one of these models, um, the wingtip that is, is you, 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 you don't need something that's transparent because here you can see mm -hmm. what it would be doing. And then if you imagine this being the wing that is pointing away from you, it would be it would be doing the same thing, right? So we don't even need a transparent thing to sort of see what it would be doing. Um, but here you can sort of see that in the sort of the side view, um, that first one is coming up and then slightly pointing back, and then as that as the bird is coming towards you, those angle backward more. True. Something that I think is really cool is the way that this last one that can kind of just sort of make this extra little when it does this and you get that extra little flip on the end. That's kind of neat. Yeah. That's that's neat. That's you like, put what? all the, the weight in the wing. That's how they push upwards. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, that owl. Um, I'll show you what I'll, I guess I'll do a, a quick journal share here. Wasn't able to get out yesterday to go journaling, but day before that, it was late. I was starting to get, you know, a little bit COVID crazy. And uh, my wife, Sabelle, said, you know, honey, why don't you and your journal? just go for uh, a little adventure for a while. And uh, so I snuck out the door, I went down to a local marsh and um, spent some quality time with 
a, um, a female teal. And I'll show you my. So beautiful. Teal. Teals. Yes. Um, so on her, let's see if we can get that focus better. I, I was doing this kind of fun exercise of trying to get myself to notice as I looked at her, what felt weird to me. Like if I had made up this bird, what I would have done differently. And when I found that when I looked at it from that perspective, there are all these things that I was seeing that like, oh, I wouldn't have thought that that connects in that way. And um, so one was that I was surprised to see. Jack, could you push your paper up higher so we can, uh, or zoom out? Thank you. Is, is, is that working? Yes. Okay. Um, so one of the little surprises for me was that I was surprised to see that I, I expected the belly feathers to be overlapping like this, kind of like snake scales. But they were kind of clearly going in these rows. Boom, 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 boom. And that was just sort of not what my brain expected those to do. So that was one kind of fun thing. The other thing that was really weird for me is that the way that the wing was folded, there's this, the, the primary feathers, the tips of those were all lined up. Do, 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 do. Oops. Do, 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 in this neat little row. And then you can see the leading edge of those feathers kind of tucked up against and kind of nested into that so that the edge of that and the secondaries made this crest. And then it felt like this was this sort of extra side thought if I had to make that up, I would have thought that you would have, um, you know, a, you know, um, that, you know, here it would be, I would, I would expect something like this, where I would see the back edges of these feathers and then these come down like that. But instead, there was this zone where it looked like all these parts were lined up. And then below that, there was this little zone like that. It was, it was like my brain was having a hard time. I wanted it to do this, and it was doing that. I wonder uh, if it's it, because of that that they make this uh, sound when they fly because of the alignment of uh, their the feathers in their wings, I wonder. Oh, interesting. Interesting thought, I don't know. Um, that's cool. So I, so my, my new kind of project now is when I look at, when I look at something, I'm going to be intentionally looking for the parts that are different than I thought they should be. And so this, this little teal was my first kind of foray into that. And it was fun. Um, let's see here. Um, were there any other journal pages that you wanted to share? Yes, um, uh, just let me, uh, I did, uh, in fact, an experiment. I, I've been uh, two experiments at the same time. And so uh, we've been lucky to get a nice season for um, maple uh, water. So to try, to, try to make some maple syrup. And then I tried to mix that with the paint I have. And oh. to see whether it changed the color. Well, that, that's interesting. I know that there's some paints are done with, um, Uh, there, there are, are, are some, some paints are done with, uh, with honey in them, but I haven't heard of doing it with, um, 
with 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 maple syrup that you've collected yourself. So do we, yeah. would you first have to um, sort of extract some of the liquid from it? So um, yeah, you uh, just uh, when it was um, uh, almost uh, yeah, it, it started almost three weeks ago, and then the. Um, and then we noticed that uh, we had like uh, just minus five during the night and just a bit above zero during the day. And then, and then you drill a hole in the maple tree and you try to aim for maple sh uh, sugar trees, but uh, we had mostly red maple around. And then uh, you put the, at slight angle, just two inches inside. And then you put like a little spout and you put your bucket under and then you come every other day, but then it became very cold again, very minus 25 degrees Celsius and, and then it stopped and then it started again, but later, and then we got like uh, uh, liters and liters uh, of, of uh, maple water. And then you have to boil that for a very long time. Uh, and the ratio is for 40 uh, liters that you get, you will get uh, only one liter of Wow. Of, uh, of uh, maple syrup so it's it, it takes uh, almost a day of boiling and then you get the precious uh, uh, liquid and it's a beautiful color and i will try to reproduce it in color with the paint it's very difficult it's so gold it's so nice and then if i was physically with you guys i would share the our precious uh, small volume we got but um yeah and it would be a next time but uh when i try to mix it with paint it was uh, during the exercise that you were doing uh, earlier with uh, another workshop with the different mix of uh, paint. And then I discovered in my different uh, paint, I didn't have any true primary red, true primary blue. So I, was, I, I had that this uh, reconning. And, but uh, so the top, uh, the bottom row is the, the color I have uh, tested. And then and the top row is with the maple sugar. Uh, added and then it um, it dilute uh, them a bit, but add uh, like a shiny aspect to it, and also uh, I think a very a nicer uh, look to the the color. I prefer really actually that result. But it took forever to dry, so I have to oh. adjust the quantity. But uh, I think I will continue the the testing. That's what, what a fun project. Um, you know, I've, I've seen people, you know, get pigment from, from trees, but I haven't seen people, um, I, I haven't seen them um, actually get the liquid. That's really fun. <clears throat> All right, um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to bounce right now because um, I'm going to be uh, meeting with some folks from our local state parks to try to set up a nature journaling program with them. Um, the, um, Avea, are you uh, still online here? No. Nope. Um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, close down the meeting. Um, and, uh, but I wanna thank everybody who shared today. If you didn't have an opportunity and would like to share something with us, I want to encourage you uh, another time to um, hold it up and we'll see what you've got going. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, this was, wow, it's now 2.30. So that means, well, you, you, the 23 people are still online here. We've been here for two and a half hours. We need a stand-up break and a chance to kind of get out, shake your legs. I want to encourage you to go for a walk, bring your nature journal, and find something of you know wonder and beauty and document it in your book. And uh, until next time, be safe, be kind. We're going to do this together. And um, let's, let's, let's be there for each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Jack. Thank you, Jack. Bye-bye, my friends. Thanks, Jack.